Hello, well, um, welcome everyone to this um, first first meeting of the um, Cerebral Palsy APPG. Um, thank you for coming and I'm really excited for the, uh, to see how this this group actually um, develops and moves forward in the future. I'm really, really pleased that it that it is um, um, taking place and that I've had the, the, the pleasure to co-chair. We need to start um, today's meeting with the, um, with an AGM um, before we get into our, our wonderful speakers. We have the, this part is the AGM where we will elect um, the chairs and co-chairs and officers. So. Um, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll, we'll get that bit out of the way first and I'll, write, I'll just read out the names that we're hoping people can agree to elect. And that's um, myself as uh, co-chair and Paul Maynard MP as co-chair, um, Dr Lisa Cameron from the SNP as an officer, Baroness Grey Thompson um, as an officer, Ruth Jones, an officer, and Jim Shannon, um, an officer, and Greg Smith as an officer. So can we um, agree to those um, members being elected? And I'm not sure actually, do people shout out if they don't agree or just put their hands up, wave? Agreed, agreed Mary. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all agreed. Brilliant, that's brilliant. Um, well, thank you for that. And I'm going to hand straight over to Paul Maynard. Hello, Paul. Uh, thank you. Can I welcome everyone to the first meeting? Great to see so many. Oh, you're all in tiny boxes. There are so <laughs> many on the call. It's uh, superb. Um, now, I've been told to ask for you all to tweet using the hashtag APPG on CP. Now, I wholly disapprove of Twitter. I think it's a complete waste of time. But those of you who like it, I'm sure will want to do that. I have no idea how to, but if you know how to do it, I'm sure you'll do it. Just don't check my Twitter feed, please. Um, now, we've also been asked, just both Mary and I, to say a few words as to why we're here and why we're doing it and why we, why we have agreed to be a co-chair. My main reason for being the co-chair is that in 10 years, I have not learned how to say no to Amanda Richardson from Action on CP. I'm constitutionally incapable of doing it. So when she asks me, I say, yes, Amanda, whatever you want, Amanda. And more worriedly, perhaps, is um, when I first came here back in 2010, I had one definite commitment I had made to myself, which is I was not going to be the MP with cerebral palsy. I was going to take no interest at all in any issue related to any form of my own personal disability. Uh, that lasted about a fortnight, sad to say. Um, um, I simply couldn't help myself with the speech and language difficulties, or mental and assistive communication, you name it, I got dragged into it. And I was rapidly becoming aware that all these disparate issues were not really being brought together because um, there was no outside organisation that really focused anymore on cerebral palsy. Scope had evolved quite rightly into a very effective campaign organisation. It didn't have the focus on cerebral palsy it had once done under its previous iteration. So I thought there was space in the market, as it were, and Amanda agreed, for an organisation like Action on CP that could evolve into an APPG. Obviously, I had a few years in ministerial office, and now that I have a bright future well and truly behind me, I can focus once again on doing APPG work. So this was a natural one for me to say yes to, because I can't say no to Amanda, of course. So I'm delighted to be here, delighted to see so many fantastic speakers on the agenda. A lot we're going to be able to do with this APPG. So I'm fascinated. I'm here to listen and learn. And I think Mary is now going to say a bit about her and her interest also. So over to Mary. And I'll turn my camera off so I don't crash it. <laughs> Thanks for that, Paul. Um, yeah, my interest in this group, well, actually, uh, similarly to to Paul, I, I well, I turned up to a, um, one of the inaugural meetings um, on cerebral palsy and was um, cried my eyes out the whole way through it um, <laughs> because of my own experience. So. Unfortunately, I wasn't getting out of that one. And Amanda and others who were so kind to me, but asked me if I would, if I would chair this meeting, uh, co-chair this meeting. So I'm a, um, a, a, 
a mother of a daughter, uh, Maria, who um, lived her whole life with quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Um, so I was a carer for 27 years. Unfortunately, Maria uh, died just a, a few years back. Um, but Maria was born um, 10 weeks prematurely and had a very difficult birth, basically a lack of equipment in any of the hospitals. There were you know, no ventilators for miles and miles and miles around. So we waited for three hours before Maria could born. So a very difficult birth. And then after that, um, we waited 10 months for a diagnosis. So a very, also a very difficult time, um, you know, because she was very premature, our local GP just kept saying that she would catch up, um, which which obviously it wasn't, wasn't very helpful. Um, so I think I, I do know that, those early months and early years are, can be very, very heartbreaking and difficult for, for, for parents and families, um, especially as a new mom. Um, so I'm very keen to um, see what we can do, what, what this group can bring to um, that early diagnosis and the, um, those very first early years of, of a child's life and, and family's life with um, people dealing with cerebral palsy. Um, I mean, even until the day she died, Maria still didn't have an adequate piece of communication equipment, and that was 27 years on. Um, so, you know, anything that we can do that can um, th that can help both um, the, the children and families will be uh, obviously very useful. Um, so on that note, I'm going to hand over to Amanda Richardson. Um, Amanda's going to um, be doing the first session and um, Amanda's the, the Chief Executive of Action Cerebral Policy. So over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm not going to speak for very long because I, there are far more interesting people to come after me, but I just would like to start by thanking everybody who's made this possible, um, especially to you, Mary and Paul, um, and all the members and officers of the group and, and to the expert speakers that we're going to hear later. Thank you so much. Um, as Paul, mentioned this journey started uh, with the parliamentary inquiry in 2014 which Paul chaired with Mark Hoban um, and our subsequent report enabling potential a new deal for children with cerebral palsy. Uh, that inquiry and the work that followed in the past six years has been driven by the question how can we substantially improve the lives of the estimated 30,000 children in the UK with cerebral palsies. And we said then, and we say now, that there is clear research evidence that the first vital step must be to have fit for purpose national protocols and systems from birth onwards for the surveillance assessment and intervention for infants with or at risk of a neurodisability such as cerebral palsy. Action CP surveys and reports since 2014 have clearly identified that unfortunately there remains an unacceptable postcode lottery and a lack of urgency in the referral of infants at risk of CP. In our latest 2018 survey, only 22 NHS trusts out of the 169 who responded were able to provide a timetable for referral for children with suspected CP and only 10% were able to say that they had a formal care pathway specifically for children and young people with the condition. And worryingly, only 13 NHS trusts were able to respond saying that they had adopted the NICE guidelines on the assessment and management of cerebral palsies in un under 25s published in 2017. We also know that cerebral palsy, a lifelong neurological condition which impacts on motor skills, mobility, health, cognition and learning, physical and mental well-being and future life prospects and is the most prevalent physical disability of childhood is an underrepresented and misunderstood condition. 
so much so that as far as I can see, there is no mention of it or indeed of any complex motor disability, unlike autism and learning disabilities in the Children and Young People's Transformation Programme of the NHS Long-Term Plan. This lack of recognition is an injustice to those many thousands of babies and children and their families who desperately need to know that the system will support them and give their children the best possible start in life. In the 2014 inquiry, Dr. Betty Hutchin, head of children's OT and physiotherapy at the Royal Free NHS Trust said, when people tell you it's not possible to identify early, it's because they haven't got the right tools. Betty was talking about the use of the qualitative assessment of general movement for infants, but what are the other tools that we need to ensure the earliest possible identification of abnormal motor development? Well, we already have an excellent tool in the NICE guidelines and quality standards, but we also believe that the answer lies in much greater knowledge of cerebral palsy and the recognition of the signs of abnormal motor development in all primary healthcare practitioners, together with a greater sense of urgency in acting on indicators, signs, and the, in, and the instincts of worried parents to facilitate swift onward referral for specialist assessment and intervention. This needs to be coupled with a determined focus on ensuring that supportive partnerships and specialist centres of excellence um, with, with local providers are in place for all infants and their families pre and post diagnosis, regardless of where they live in the UK. It is our hope that this APPG will shine a light on how we can make real and lasting changes to the life prospects of infants and children with a cerebral palsy and their families. And we are really, really grateful to all those who support this aim. We also hope that in time, the APPG will move on to examine issues which affect people of all ages with CP and so enable them to live the happy, healthy and full fulfilled lives to which they are entitled. Well, it's now my pleasure and privilege to introduce Bert Martin, um, who will say a few words about the impact of early intervention on his life. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. Thank you, Amanda. Hello, I'm Bert Martin, and I'm here mainly, to be honest, to provide an example of what can be achieved through early intervention and best practice. Unfortunately, at the moment, as we're all aware, um, my circumstance is a rarity and is indeed a postcode lottery. But as I sit here with a golden ticket, I'd just like to give you a bit of a brief timeline, if I may. My journey began with a diagnosis of quadriplegic cerebral palsy at eight months old, with referrals to the Child Development Centre in Milton Keynes, where physio and occupational therapy sessions were bi-weekly rather hit and miss and ultimately sadly not fit for purpose. Unfortunately my recollection of this period in my life is rather hazy as you can imagine but thankfully my journey of true early intervention began with the Pace Centre in Aylesbury, a charitable organisation and a school for children with motor disorders staffed by a multidisciplinary team of teachers, therapists and conductors. We as a family found Pace through a conversation my mother had had with a friend who had a connection to PACE. For me at age one, this was actually incredibly fortuitous because we hadn't had any signposts from professionals at that point um, that we were seeing within the NHS. So that's yet again, another example of the lottery. In my mother's own words, we as a family had been plunged into a world of disability we knew nothing about. Then when we found PACE, we were no longer alone. What for me, my mother so accurately articulates here is that through early intervention and education into the world of cerebral palsy, we were not only given hope, but genuinely given the tools, support and education to implement a lifestyle that could truly take in its stride. The addition of standing frames, splints, sleep systems, home physio programmes, enabling us as a family to really take ownership of the situation and to achieve each milestone from a position of knowledge and understanding. 
This early intervention gave me and my family true command over my disability. And most importantly, it taught us as a family how I was going to gain my independence. And ultimately gave me the roadmap to my future. We began to build a team from the Pace Centre and the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre in Oxford, which I'm sure some of you will be aware of, and to get our ducks in a row at home. It was decided then that I was an ideal candidate for multi-level surgery. I do just want to stop and stress at this point that it was only as a result of early intervention that I was even a candidate for surgery. I have many recollections of this period in my life, but perhaps one of the most poignant and worth sharing with you guys today is um, the comments that were made by my lead consultant during my preoperative assessment. His words were, I can only do some of the work. 25% of the work needs to have been done already to get to this point. Perhaps 50% can be put down to surgical intervention and the remaining 25% in aftercare and rehabilitation. I still thank my lucky stars to this day that I had the early intervention in order to stop the contractures in my knees from forming to enable me to have the surgery um, and for it to have even been possible or for it to be a success. Throughout my time at PACE and the Nuffield, I was given a platform on which to build. The relationship between PACE and the Nuffield appeared at its strongest for me and most poignant in the months immediately after my multi-level surgery. Everyone was certainly singing from the same hymn sheet, whether I was stood between the parallel bars a week post-surgery with the Nuffield physios or indeed three months post-surgery with the PACE team. It suffice to say, that it's a combination of a surgeon's steady hand, the expert implementation of a multi-transdisciplinary team, and my family's education and subsequent expertise that has enabled me to walk up to the podium today, or would do if there was one. Um, I now reflect, to be honest, that the whole process has been 10 years in the making. In a nutshell, I'm struck by the fact that if I hadn't had the benefit of daily physio, OT input, and an engaged and informed family, my surgical outcomes would have been incredibly different and not served the intended purpose. For me, the holistic impact and approach to early intervention is best exemplified with an anecdote. I fondly remember fighting with my twin brother and my older brother shouting at the time, no Bert, use your right hand to hit him. I hope this illustrates how integrated and normalised my therapies had become into family life. <laughs> For me personally, this really embodies the emotional impact of early intervention because it made my experiences part of the family narrative and attitude and allowed my family to share in the highs and lows of daily life with an informed perspective. The time came when I was to enter secondary education. The foundations had been laid mine and my family's knowledge fortified, and all importantly, key skills learned, including independent toileting, dressing, and eating. I had an awareness of how to move thoughtfully, but probably the most important thing, to be honest, is a belief in the value of my own independence and a can-do attitude. I continued to receive outreach <laughs> from PACE and the Nuffield, and we were continually reminded of the key learnings. As my priorities started to shift, and my life ultimately started to develop. This support network carried me through my secondary education and as a result um, my family were both well informed and well placed to support me and keep me on track. Testament to the success of this is that I'm currently completing my application to university and I'm still very much implementing the attitudes and techniques that have been installed in me from a young age. My early intervention taught me that if you drop a pencil, you'll be taught how to pick it up. <laughs> Those words and the meanings behind them, for me, are very instrumental into the man that I'm becoming, and I hope will fortify me in the trials and tribulations to come. But the one thing that I am truly confident about is that I have been given the tools for the job to take responsibility and control of my future. It suffice to say that without early intervention, it would have been a completely different story and you guys would have all been in for a very bitter five minutes. I, I would not have the future I have before me 
no more dignity or independence. That is what is at stake here and what best practice can achieve. I certainly hope that we as a society do not fail and that there will be plenty of other stories like mine, regardless of the postcode or circumstance in the years to come. Thank you for listening to that. Well, I think I'm asked to provide some comments to that, but uh, I've only got one word. Wow. Um, <laughs> so I'm a hard bitten cynical Tory bastard 99% of the time, <laughs> but even that has brought a lump to my throat and you've done yourself immense justice. You're a credit to the Pace Centre, undoubtedly, and to Amanda and the work they do there. But I think a credit to yourself and your family. Um, what Two words leapt out to me there. One was discipline, and the mm. discipline you've had to show throughout your life to keep on track, as he put it. I, I, I get that entirely, and I warn you now, it doesn't stop just at 18. I'm still having to be disciplined with my exercises even at the age of 44, so mm. that's not going to end anytime soon, I'm afraid to say. But the key word to me was fortuitous. Uh, you used it in regard to, I think it was your mother speaking to someone who happened to know uh, something about it. And that is the most common story I hear. It was fortuitous in my case as well. And I continue to worry, and have done for many years now, what about the parents who don't have that capital, who don't have that those contacts, who aren't lucky when they need to be lucky, and the consequences that has for the children themselves. So... Um, you've reinforced the key learning and you've uh, left me struggling for words, which is quite unique. So uh, if you can shut a pol Tory politician up or you've achieved something today, I can tell you that for nothing. So thank, thank you very you. much indeed for those comments. I don't know whether Mary wanted to write anything. because it says so Yeah, yeah that absolutely <laughs> amazing story, Bert. And um, I guess, you know, all the best for the future. It looks as if you're going to go a, a long way. Um, I think it highlights though those different degrees of cerebral palsy as well, the, the different yeah. degrees of the condition. And whilst my daughter, she was, um, she didn't have any um, voice. Uh, well, no, she did have a voice, very much had a voice. She didn't, she didn't speak <laughs> very well. Um, yeah. And um, was, had a lot of physical difficulties as well with operations and was in pain a lot. And, um, but that, that, I guess, her, she would have actually, her personality meant that she would have preferred to just lie in bed, listen into people's conversations, watch the telly and and have fun. So, you know, you do need an amount of discipline and that you have definitely got that determination. Unfortunately, Maria could be very lazy <laughs> and probably wouldn't have, have achieved what you have. But um, have day. yeah, that, that's... <laughs> Yeah, she got she got a she got away with a lot. Maria did, but that absolutely oh, wonderful why? story. <laughs> and you're a great role model for others. Well, I'm an example of what can be achieved through early intervention and best practice. And to be honest, that's what I want everyone to take away from this today: is that you know, if we can, if we can get something in place that means it's not such a lottery, and actually, you know, as yeah. as Paul says, it doesn't have to be fortuitous. If that's what we can achieve and we can bring that up so that there are other stories like mine, as I say, regardless of postcode or circumstance, then we'll have done a good thing. Very true. Now, I think we're now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Charlie Fairhurst. I can see him in the top corner, so he's, I know he's there and ready. He's a consultant in paediatric neurodisability which is easy for him to say, not for me. Um, <laughs> and he discusses standards, um, rather he's going to discuss standards across regions and whether we need a national standard of best practice that I gather he has already developed. I also gather there will be a PowerPoint presentation that Hannah will be coordinating. He's waving his hands a bit dodgily at that, so who knows, maybe, maybe not. But I'm going to- There is, but we don't have to use it. <laughs> Hannah's going to hand over to Charlie and I'm going to shut up again and turn my- Hello, can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Nod, Amanda, if you can hear me. Yes, excellent. I'm used to Amanda nodding as well. Um, it's, it's lovely to meet you all. I, I've done 
a fair few APBGs over the years, but this actually is the one that is is closest to my heart by a, by a long, long way. I have a very learned experience rather than a lived experience of cerebral palsy in, in that uh, when I was a paediatric neurology uh, um, registrar back in prehistory when most of you were, were twinkles in your parents' eyes, um, the reason why I got really involved and really interested in it is that that even in specialist centers, I was going, I was seeing children with a variety of neurological disorders and, and children were admitted for long periods of time. They were, nothing was moving forward. Very little was happening. And these were, uh, Mary, the, the, like your lovely daughter, the most complex end of the cerebral palsy population. Uh, uh, and so I sort of took it on as a personal crusade, uh, and I've now been a consultant for 22 years and, and lead up the services in, in South Thames, but, but have been involved in a whole variety of, of international conferences uh, and international working parties on cerebral palsy. Um, I chaired the NICE guideline on cerebral palsy for children and young people and was a clinical advisor uh, for the adult one. So um, I have a very clear idea uh, of learning experiences from the wonderful families and the wonderful young people that I, I uh, share. Um, the oldest uh, individual with cerebral palsy, I look, the, the oldest child I look after as a paediatrician is 86 years old. Uh, um, and uh, um, uh, again, in the CP world, that transitional element is, is a real challenge. But we're focusing very much today on the element of uh, uh, initial assessment and initial uh, uh, intervention. And that was really very much at the heart of uh, the cerebral palsy guidelines. So Hannah, if you just gently flip through to slide eight, uh, it'll give people very much an idea of, of whatever. So the NICE cerebral palsy guidelines, which were um, uh, developed through from around about 2015 through to 2017, came on the back of a NICE guideline on a wider element of children's movement disorders called the NICE spasticity guideline, which gave a very clear idea about how we should intervene, how we should help, how we should support young people with movement disorders per se. But what came out of that was a clarity of thought process that actually we needed to deep delve and do a really extensive guideline on all the other areas of cerebral palsy and the management and the assessment and early intervention uh, and lifelong care for individuals with cerebral palsy because that was missing from the equation. Uh, and though the movement disorder is critical uh, uh, part of the jigsaw, it's very much wider. And with regards to what we're focusing on today, this slide gives us a clear idea of where it fits together. So when you're looking at risk and causation of cerebral palsy from a neurological viewpoint, there are basically two pathways that the children will present to the child development center or the specialist. Part of it is a high risk population. So those children that were born prematurely, certainly before 32 weeks, certainly at 30 weeks gestational age, certainly children now who should have neuroimaging on the neonatal department. And that population need a very focused, increased surveillance managed by the tertiary level. So that any abnormalities of their movement patterns, any asymmetry of their movement is picked up at a very early stage. That child is then uh, um, sent to the multidisciplinary team at the child development center. They should have their own standards. And in a network that works well, they are managed from a peer support viewpoint so that minimum intervention as soon as possible is in place uh, for that child. The other group uh, that children with cerebral palsy present via is via the routine neurodevelopmental surveillance program, the Red Book system. Uh, and again, Mary, as, as you have stated, what, what we see unfortunately far too often is children that, that, that are, are lost between those two pillars. And very often children who have been born prematurely, who have had problems with uh, uh, neonatal intensive care units, 
uh, stays are presenting to the general practice the primary care situation uh, and they're just told the parents are told oh, you're just a little late because because you know that you were premature the child was premature and, and i'm sure things will get better absolutely not if there is any disparity in fine motor in gross motor in feeding and there are a wide variety again as amanda sort of uh, uh, alluded to earlier uh, a wide variety of very simple very easy ways that you can pick up motor abnormalities very very early you can then re refer the child through to the child development center where the specialist pediatricians can look and assess and see whether there is anything clearly with regards to risk and causation and if they have any concerns they can refer through to the green elements of this, which is the specialist centers who can look for uh, red flags for a, a more progressive neurological disorder. They can consider an MRI if early neonatal imaging has not been performed. And then they can work together in a networked pathway of trying to facilitate the best practice possible for children and young people uh, through uh, their early years uh, um, and then gaining together with education and social care throughout the whole of their life. And again, with regards to the cerebral palsy in children and young people assessment and management NICE guideline, we developed four clear quality standards that all trusts across the United Kingdom should be measured against. And three of four of these are clearly appropriate to do with the early assessment and early intervention. So the first quality standard being that you have to have a enhanced surveillance program managed from a regional and a local viewpoint for all children who've been through a neonatal intensive care unit who are at greater risk of developing a cerebral palsy uh, for at least the first two years of their life. The second one is, is that any child who has a delayed fine motor or gross motor milestone or an asymmetry of movement at a very early stage must be referred as a rapid urgent referral through to a child development centre so that an assessment can't be done. And it's not appropriate just to sit on the child and say, oh, we'll see you in a few weeks time. We'll see you in a couple of years. I see children referred age five uh, uh, to my services, a 12 to my services that had a barn door abnormality of their motor milestone uh, uh, in the early neonatal early baby stages and they're only seeing they're only only we are only considering uh, um, uh, providing them with the support uh, at a very late stage uh, of their life and they've lost all the capacity for the early neuroplasticity the early benefit from a multidisciplinary targeted intervention at an early stage. But the other factor that's really important is that we must share information uh, uh, with the parents and carers, and we need to support them through the early pathways of having a child with a physical neurodisability and all those comorbid, whether it's a physical, functional, developmental or clinical challenges that that child and that family have to face. And we really need to be developed uh, 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 and part and parcel of that process from an early stage. Those quality standards are there. They are looked at, as Amanda said, by a variety of uh, trusts uh, uh, across uh, England, Wales and Scotland also use them frequently, but they are not universally uh, adhered to. And equally, as Amanda alluded to, there are excellent exemplars of good pathways where fantastic local child development centres have a clear hub and spoke relationship with their central uh, neurosciences centre so that we can facilitate and assess specialist interventions in movement, specialist interventions in feeding, specialist in, in, uh, interventions in hearing, and etc. right across development, right across function, right across clo uh, clinical comorbidity. And when it works, it works well. And again, with another hat on, uh, as the clinical lead for paediatric neurosciences at NHS England, what is very, very clear is that we must have equity of access for all children and all families across England and Wales. It is not acceptable that a child in Yarmouth has a different pathway from a child in Yeovil to a child in Bromley. It is just not uh, acceptable uh, uh, um, in our modern world. So you've got the slides there, you can look through them later. 
uh, um, it, it'll give you a, a slightly clearer idea on, on thought processes to what we focused on with regards to management as well as assessment. But that's me, I'll be quiet now. Uh, uh, and if there are any questions, I'm more than happy uh, to answer away either now or later. Okay, um, thank you um, for that. That was very, very interesting. Um, very interested to know about those two groups. And obviously, um, you know, who knows what, what the outcome may have been if Maria did have a, an assessment earlier on and had that early invent, intervention, but we, we'll never know. I'm just looking at the time, and unless Paul has anything to, uh, to add there, I would just like to introduce the next speaker. Is that, would yeah, that be yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Um, Thank, thank you um, so much, Charlie. Um, and I want to move um, on to Dr. Anna Basu, who is Clinical Senior Lecturer and Honorary Consultant Pediatric Neurologist at Newcastle University. Um, so I'll hand over to you, um, Anna. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk uh, today. It's been really inspiring listening to everything so far. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a child neurologist and a researcher at Newcastle. I, I've been doing research into cerebral palsy for 20 years, I realised when, when I was looking at this. So um, hopefully I've got something to say that's useful to, to listen to. So here we go. I mean, um, so basically it's obvious, but early intervention is a really important topic because infants grow and develop and change so much in the first few years of life. Their brains are doing the same thing. Their nervous systems are developing hugely. And if we aren't working with at-risk infants in those first few years of life, we're missing a massive opportunity to shape a developing nervous system. But we can't intervene early if we haven't got the infants, if they haven't been referred in and detected. So we've, they've got to be detected earlier. And at the moment, the average age at diagnosis of cerebral palsy is around two years. And in that time, not only may infants either not be getting any intervention, or they might not be getting the most tailored intervention based on the best understanding of what's going on. And their parents are dealing with huge levels of anxiety, uncertainty, and they're not being supported appropriately. Um, and actually, you know, we could do, we could do better than this um, because there are things that we can do to change this. I'm sure of that. So one is we need to be educating frontline healthcare professionals at a grassroots level to, um, to be identifying infants with movement problems and, 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 referring, and referring in. So um, it does need some training because the younger the child, the harder it is to notice the signs. Um, so training is necessary and this could be done in various ways. I mean, we've been, I really care about this. We've been working on an introductory training package that's a couple of hours for frontline healthcare professionals called TEDDY or training in early detection for early intervention. And we're, we've rolled that out, we're evaluating it. There'd be other ways of doing it too, I'm sure, but we need to be doing this, this is important. Um, and secondly, um, so this is come back to, it comes back to what um, Charlie said, that, so that there are these two groups. There's a group of um, infants who are, you know, preterm, high risk, who, should, who need good developmental surveillance. Um, and that needs to be, those pathways need to be strengthened, but also, um, only about 50% of infants who develop CP come from that pathway. So the other 50%-ish come from babies who, di who didn't have that obvious um, you know, prematurity or difficult start. So if we only do high-risk developmental surveillance, we'll miss the other half of kids and they won't get their first developmental follow-up till they're nine months old and then they'll get another one at two years. So what are we doing in those first nine months? We should be looking at all infants with, with, um, with a, a closer, you know, there should be some surveillance. So, and the perfect age to do this would be around three or four months for the first one, because parents are beginning to sort of have suspicions, voice their concerns, and movement difficulties can actually start to be detected a bit more easily with, with assessments at this age. For example, with the general movements assessment that Betty Hutchin was talking about before, and other tests too. Um, so, I mean, the other thing to say is there is an evidence base for early identification. The papers have been out. There are standardized tools. We know that neuroimaging helps. We know what the sensitivity, what, the, what the, good, the good tools are. And we're not, they're not being used and people don't, aren't trained enough in them. So, um, and, and yet we know 
um, I was looking, there was there's a recently published USA based study that shows that if you use these tools and you use algorithms for early detection, um, in, in, in a group of USA centers, they halved the age at CP diagnosis from 20 months to 10 months by doing that. But that did involve implementing a change in practice, which was not only using the tests and the assessments, but having an infant review at three to four months. So, and then, okay, so here we are, we've now um, trained healthcare professionals, we're identifying infants earlier, and then we have a duty to make sure that these infants and their families are supported by effective early intervention programmes. Um, so we need to have it good joined up early intervention programmes, putting the child and the family at the centre with a team that's working together around um, that child. Um, so I, I'm Betty Hutchins on this call as well, and it's, this is really her baby, but there is an in initiative in the UK called EI Smart, which is about getting early intervention right. Um, and we're, we're really trying to ensure that um, healthcare workers and parents have access to up-to-date information about early intervention and best practice and we're trying to do training um, so that we um, so that best practice is shared um, because this is really important. Um, there is much more room for improving um, the um, evidence base for early intervention still though as well. Um, there is a good evidence base but it needs to grow. Um, I'm doing my best with this bit. I've developed and piloted a, an early intervention package for infants with perinatal stroke, but I still need to go and evaluate that in a full trial and other, there are other projects that other people need to do as well. And then, as I say, we really do need to remember that parents of infants with emerging cerebral palsy have a lot on their plates and we need um, psychological support needs to be there much more as a, you know, as, as a given because, um, you know, not everybody will need it or want to take it up, but a lot of people will. And um, uh, because it's, we know from talking to parents and we know from the literature, there's huge amounts of uncertainty, anxiety, the diagnostic process is very hard. Um, and so we need to be supporting um, parents. So um, that's a lot of asks I've put in there, but I really think we need them all. <laughs> we need to be doing frontline healthcare professional grassroots education. We need to have better developmental surveillance for high risk and general population infants. We need to be using the most effective um, algorithms um, for detecting high-risk infants and then we need to be investing in and delivering good early intervention um, and, ed um, and education programs and supporting parents. <laughs> so all I ask but if we did that we'd make a lot of difference to a lot of children with CP and their families. Thank you Anna. Uh, I think it's my turn to respond now. I, I, I don't mind how long the shopping list is um, the longer the better, in my view, because the more fundamental the changes we can then deliver. So to me, it's important that you have the expertise. We as MPs have the convening power and the ability to lobby ministers, um, just as we've, we've done in the past on other issues. So uh, the longer you're shopping this, the happier I am, the more I can talk about in my debate. So fine by me. So, so keep on coming. I wonder whether Mary ha has a response she wants to make or given the time once again I'm happy to move on. I'm getting a yes from Mary. So next we have Alison Morton from the Institute of Health Visiting. Um, I love health visiting. I've stood on four elections promising thousands of more health visitors. So I'm amazed there are 10,000 people in the Zoom call from you. And maybe that's a debate for another time as to whether or not more of you yet, despite our best efforts. But Alison, over to you to talk about uh, the health visiting side of things. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I think Hannah's got some slides to put up for me. That's great. Thank you. So um, thanks to Paul and uh, Mary for inviting me. I'm absolutely delighted um, speaking about the role of the health visitor today. Um, I work at the moment at the Institute of Health Visiting, uh, but I've been a health visitor for many years. I'm speaking not only as a health visitor, but also as a mother of a fabulous young man who is now 22, um, who dares to dream big like Bert. And I'll tell you a bit more about him in a minute. And it I'm really delighted as well to be joined by Charlie Fairhurst, who was actually a consultant who made a big difference to my son. And I haven't met Charlie since, so it's been a long time, but it's great that we meet again today. Do you want to move on to the next slide, please? 
So in my role as a health visitor, I've learned two very important things um, about life, really. The first is that all parents want the best start in life for their children. They all have hopes and aspirations. Uh, but actually, we know that there are thousands of reasons why life doesn't work out the way that we'd hoped, not least discovering that you have a child with a disability uh, when you weren't planning to have one. Uh, you join a club that no one chooses to join, actually. Uh, saying that, it's a club where I have learned the most about myself as a human being and about the rest of the world, so I wouldn't change it for a, a, a moment, really. The other thing that I learned is that equally all children have hopes and aspirations, no matter how disabled they are or, or whatever the difficulties are that they are that they face. They have hopes and aspirations, but sadly we live in a world where we know that some children are much more likely to achieve their hopes uh, than others. Um, and disadvantage starts early, uh, the effects are cumulative and they can last a lifetime as Mary has shared her story with us already. A little boy on the left of the slide is my son Sam when he was little, he had hopes and aspirations. And when he was really small he dreamed of being a crocodile, I said what do you want to be when you grow up? He said I want to be a crocodile, I said that's a bit difficult really but um, then he went through all the usual you know I want to be a fireman and there he is picking blackberries but um, he was born prematurely so there's a theme coming isn't there um, and he was diagnosed when he was 10 months old. I was told that you know expect the worst, he's unlikely to walk or talk, he's probably going to be incontinent and you know just put him in a special school and forget about him kind of thing. Um, and yet I was lucky because I was a health visitor at the time and I, I wanted him to embrace this world that he was born into and to really have the very best start in life. So we pushed hard all the doors um, and um, like people have said earlier, you shouldn't have to bang on all the doors. It shouldn't have to be quite so hard, but it is. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? So what does a health visitor do? Well, health visitors are specialist community public health nurses um, who then go on and do a qualification in public health and working with children and families across a breadth of, of different um, issues that might affect uh, early, the earliest years of life. Uh, they work with all families, so they're uniquely placed to be this vital safety net, but my view is their role is not being maximised. Uh, they work in a complex system, so work with multiple agencies. Um, and, and there's a lot that we can do to, to, to use their skills better. So across the top, I just set out a few things. So prevention, obviously preterm is, is a high risk factor. So health visitors uh, work in um, supporting parents through pregnancy to stop smoking and a number of other risk factors that reduce preterm birth. Um, but also um, acquired brain injury uh, in the earliest years of life so through accident prevention is another a place where health visitors also work into that system. Uh, the next step is the early identification and, and this is a difficult time for families because people have said you don't always recognize the early signs certainly myself um, when my son was about six weeks old he i remember him arching his back and looking back at me um, in his six week check with the gp and the gp just said oh look he's looking at you and i thought i don't know there was just that thing that flashed across my mind i thought it doesn't look quite right but actually it was it took ages before i would accept it and it was about 10 months when he got to finally diagnosed and it was a huge journey uh, personally, it felt like somebody had blown a hole right through the middle of me um, and, and everything flashed in front of me. How was, he, how was his life going to pan out? What would he be like at 18? Um, little did I know I didn't need to worry, actually, because um, we would go on that journey together and we had fabulous people who supported us. So the health visitor's role is to be there for that journey, holding that family. They're all different and they all want different things at different times. Um, even in a day, you might go through a whole range of emotions, but really important that, that families have people around them who understand at the time. Um, and then there's this vital safety net. I heard a new word a couple of weeks ago, Professor of uh, Workforce Planning at South Bank. It's called kaplunking. You know, the game It's where children fall through the system. <laughs> And health visitors provide that hopefully vital safety net to stop children kaplunking through a system if we strengthen them. So if you move on to the next slide. Um, the picture on the right was designed to me by a parent in Hampshire when I worked there, uh, and it describes the multitude of agencies that uh, families engage with um, in the first years of a child's life with a disability. Uh, they say it can feel overwhelming uh, and as a whole raft I won't list them all there and so we did a big survey at the Institute of Health Visiting asking families what they wanted from health visiting in general so it wasn't specific to uh, special needs and what they said was they wanted a service that was personalized to them where people collaborated and worked together clearly they wanted it to be effective and evidence-driven but responsive to changing needs over time 
uh, accessible. Um, you know, different families are disadvantaged. They find it much harder to access services and we need to break down the barriers that stop them getting the support that they need. And it needs to be fairer. There are huge inequalities. I'm very aware that I was very privileged uh, working in the system that I knew where to go for my son. And clearly Bert's family did for him too. Uh, and it's not right that, that some families don't know that and, and their children are disadvantaged. And, and the most disadvantaged families struggle the most, we know that. Uh, and in order to do that, we need health professionals with autonomy to walk alongside families to help them to navigate the system and to provide the individualized support. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, this is a, just a, uh, we, when I told people that I was presenting today, I had a whole editor's case study sent to me where it had gone well, which is always great to celebrate. There's a nice case study on the right where it had gone well. This is a dad in Hampshire. His wife had triplets. This is a terrible story, actually. She died 10 days after giving birth to the triplets and he was left in special care with three tiny, tiny babies. And um, the little boy, he's lying on the floor in the blue t-shirt. Um, the help is to recognize when he was about four months old that he wasn't uh, using one arm as much as the other. And he had, was diagnosed by six months and this dad got excellent support for him. And the quote at the bottom, he just says, it's no exaggeration to say that the outcome my children find themselves in now is significantly improved thanks many to the health visitor. Her drive, energy, knowledge and support inspires me to push myself and in a sense the children to celebrate and live life to the max. And that's what I want for all children and all families to get that support. So that's the good news. Uh, just move on to the next slide, which is the current reality, sadly. Uh, health visiting is facing massive challenges. So we've had huge public health grant cuts. We have one part of government saying they want um, health visitors to do this, that and the other. All the time, wherever I go, they say the health visitor could help with this. And I go, yes, you're absolutely right. And then the other branch of government are cutting the health visiting service through the public health grant cut, which leads to unwarranted variation, which I know the others have mentioned in their presentations. And actually the bottom point on that slide, the cost of failing to intervene early is absolutely enormous. All we are doing is kicking the can down the road because children won't grow up like Bert and like my son, Sam, and be able to be independent and earn a living. Um, and, and the cost of that is enormous. And we need to think about that. Um, and, and actually COVID, what COVID has done is has forgotten children largely. Um, a lot of the policy that's come out has been adult focused about stopping the virus. And actually the impact of COVID on children with special educational needs and disabilities, uh, uh, you know, is enormous and they haven't been heard and, and they have been forgotten by the system. So any parliamentarians here who are able to <laughs> push that would be great. And then moving on to my last slide, which is kind of my happy slide. This is son, my son Sam at 22. He's just uh, graduated from university last summer. Uh, he got a first class honours degrees in English language and creative writing. He's now doing his master's. He wants to be a famous film director, so watch out for him. <laughs> and good luck with your application, but I'm sure you'd be amazing. And that, that's all from me. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. That um, very interesting once again. Um, and yeah, it, it also highlights that postcode lottery in intervention in health services and of course um funding funding also um and um unless again unless paul has anything he he wants to add i'd like to, Sorry, to I did not and like if you could graph. you might want to drop me an email i did not like that graph one iota so drop me an email uh now that uh, move on to the next person please yeah well i, I did think that was going to um Moving nicely to the next speaker, um, Simon, Simon Kenny, um, National Clinical Director for Children and Young People at NHS England. And um, Simon's going to share with us the, the funding and policy context for cerebral palsy in um, uh, NHS England. So may have some thoughts on, on, um, on Alison's input there around um, uh, the lack of funding for for health visitors and the the impact of 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 austerity really, um, and what we're going through now on on funding, or maybe not. Maybe that wasn't the presentation, but they there you are throwing that anyway. So um, over to you, Simon. Thanks, Mary. In fact, I haven't got a presentation, so but I do would like to address that to be honest. So I'm Simon Kenny. Sorry that I'm having to wear a mask, but I'm in a clinical area at the moment. Uh, and I'm a paediatric surgeon by training and um, lucky enough to work at Alder Hay, which is a children's hospital with a fantastic gate laboratory, uh, selective dorsal rhizotomy and all the services um, 
that uh, children need. And um, so, but just to, just to cover the point about um, health visiting, it's to say that health visitors aren't actually funded as part of the NHS, it's through Public Health England. And obviously uh, recent changes mean that um, where health visiting sits in future is under review. And I think it is an important area to think about in terms of policy. Um, and the separation of health visiting from the rest of the NHS to a certain extent can create problems in providing a completely joined up service, although we work closely, very closely together with Public Health England. And I see that Viv Bennett's on the call now and um, we meet on a probably all too regular basis for Viv to uh, see me. Um, in terms of the long term plan, um, it, I would hope i think when you when you see a big document like that you, the concern is that it creates winners and losers and it, if there isn't an explicit acknowledgement of a particular group within the long-term plan that uh somehow there's a perception that focus may be lost and i think it's only part of a wider pro process of transformation in the nhs so i've been in post for one year and the children and young people's team uh, was extremely small in NHS England when I joined. We had actually had three people full time um, and now we've grown to 15 on the on the back of the um, long term plan. Um, and the the bit which this fits into is really the starting well initiative. And, and part of that is by creating safer births and reducing the incidence of cerebral palsy by reducing the incidence of brain injury. But also it's in terms of looking at these uh, systems of care that we uh, are providing and providing that the joined up service that children need, because we've heard so eloquently from Bert and from uh, all the other speakers about the need for early identification. Um, the way in which that will work is through a number of systems really, but the, the, probably the main one is by integrated care systems, which aren't currently a statutory uh, organization but they are be, being rolled out across um, the NHS and um, children and young people we have just released funding into the uh, integrated care systems for uh, regional leadership um, with clinical leads and management support and that's going to be on a uh, seven regional footprint but also go down to the integrated care system and that is going to be backed up by uh, a quite comprehensive data framework um, and the idea is working with NHSX and NHS Digital is that we use data to start to look and probe for areas of inequality and access. And uh, prior to doing this job, I, well, I still am uh, for getting it right first time. So I've visited 90 hospitals in doing that and see wh whatever area of healthcare you look at, you see unwarranted variation in care. And it's only by having the data about, as, as we've heard about what age children are being diagnosed with cerebral palsy, that we can start to benchmark different systems and uh, start to hold them to account. So the strategies that we're going to be using is working with integrated care systems and with de designing a data framework, which is, allows us to sort of highlight those areas. And then with regards to those high risk children, the other um, organization which has come into play just at the start of COVID was operational delivery networks, which sit on a regional footprint. So again, there's 10 of them across the country, um, but they, there is a pediatric intensive care operational delivery network. And as well as being engaged in the day-to-day -day operational running of uh, pediatric intensive care, we're starting already to look at things like bereavement services for, for parents um, affected by children who are critically ill. And things like our, um, the follow-up of children who've been on intensive care and identification of problems will, will be delivered through the operational delivery network, working with those intensive care units. And that's quite an easy thing to do because there's a relatively small number of intensive care units across the country. Um, and I think that is probably what I'd just like to say. And the other thing just in terms of policy is is pushing the need for a single identifier um, in healthcare, in social care and education um, to allow us to sort of join up those, th those systems with information. And as was also mentioned by several speakers, we're also deeply concerned about the in inequity of access 
due to um, poverty or due to being um, of ethnic minority groups. And so all our data frameworks are looking at that to analyze where we can see that were potential inequities arising. But thanks very much for the opportunity to speak and listen to all the speakers. I found it really interesting and helpful. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. That was really interesting from a policy point of view and the challenge we as MPs face in delivering change in this place. So that's been very helpful in setting out the parameters of what is achievable and maybe what isn't achievable. So I found that very helpful. Now I'm conscious of time. I know there is a, a section identified for Q&A. So if people want to type into the chat function very quickly, they can do. And I will, whilst I do that for the next 10 seconds, I will just um, tell a small anecdote. You may, some of you will know Anna Reeves up at the ACE Centre in Oldham, who does a lot of work with augmentative and assistive technology and spreading that around the country. And I used to chair her APPG uh, a long while ago. And I just happened to get in touch with her yesterday because her name came up uh, with regards to something else. And she said, and I said to her, oh, do you really want me back involved in your APPG? I mean, you know, I didn't make much difference last time, did I? It was all a bit of, you know, just talk for God's sake. She said, no, on the contrary, without you, we wouldn't have changed clinical pathways in the way we did. You transformed things. We now have 150 million more in spending than we had before. So any of you thinking that this doesn't make a difference in the end is perhaps um, I, we need to all be a bit more optimistic because it shows what can be achieved even when we don't realise that we are achieving it. So uh, if that gives you optimism, uh, then uh, please do take that optimism. Now, looking uh, at the questions, um, Bert has one, um, but I might, uh, we'll come back to Bert in a minute, but can we just go to Amanda first of all? Uh, she can she can unmute herself and then we'll we'll finish with Bert on a on a further positive note, I reckon. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, I, I don't know, it might be Alison or, or possibly Simon, I'd really like to um see how perhaps the child health record or red book um could be better used to monitor um early early motor milestones and early um early well concerns really because i know a lot of parents put a lot of um you know faith in their red book um and it might be a brilliant way to help parents also um understand ch normal child development i don't know if anybody else has got a comment about that Yes, I'm happy to pick that up, Amanda. I, I agree. I think there were a couple of things that came out of this, the presentations today that, that I think we can look into. And the Red Book is definitely one, making parents aware of what normal development is. And the other idea that was suggested was a three to four month review. And I noticed that Viv's left the call, but I know PHE are looking into a three to four month review for the health visiting model for England. So um, I don't think they'd actually incorporated gross motor development into that, but I think it would be timely to highlight and hopefully Viv picked up that point. So I think it's twofold really. It's one, the health visitors having the knowledge and skills. And I think there is some, a learning and development needed. Um, so I'm interested to pick up with um, Anna as well uh, about maybe moving that forward. Um, so it's twofold really, parents and practitioners. Certainly, I think uh, the health visitors and general practice, I mean, it is that that is the key element of family care that we need to focus on, on the education that, that uh, um, uh, early assessment of abnormal motor function is, is um, if we can pick that up as soon as possible and refer on to the specialist centres. But it, it, is, it is a wider education across the whole world of, of paediatrics and uh, uh, healthcare specialists. So um, Amanda, the Digital Red Book's also uh, being, is, is being introduced uh, next year. And uh, the idea of that is that it just stops being quite a passive document that parents hold. Uh, and it also is a source of information and enables uh, flags for both parents and professionals for when referral should take place. So you can see how that could work as part of providing an early referral system. Excellent. Oh, I carry on. I just, just, yeah, over time and people like to finish on time. I'd just like to, could I just ask who is responsible for um, designing the content or, or contributing to the content of that red book and how can we influence the inclusion of motor milestones in that? Uh, it's sort of the Children and Young People's Programme and uh, NHSX and 
health visitors as well, the Institute of Health Visitor play an important role as well. So I think you've got two of the three components on this meeting. It might be worth inviting NHSX in. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm not ready to say no to Amanda, so that's a good step. Um, Bert, do you want to finish with a few comments? Because I know you were keen to come in with, with some observations. Well, to be honest, I just wanted to um, make sure that, you know, this, is, this has all been incredibly interesting for me and I'm feeling more and more like a success story than ever before. Um, but I do just want to make sure that we're galvanising the conversation and if and if there's anything that, that I can do on a personal level to, to help translate it to, to genuine political weight, then, then I'm very happy to, to do that. And um, I, you know, I just want to say that from, from all of the professionals that I've listened to today, I think we're in good hands. We just need to work hard. Well, you certainly have a role to play. You are a compelling advocate uh, on your behalf and on behalf of the wider CP community. Uh, Amanda and I will probably have a, uh, Mary will probably have a chat about this. I used to chair the all-party group for young disabled people, which I think has fallen into abeyance now. I've not been asked to go back to it. So, and that was run by the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign. Uh, and most of the people on it were, were people with muscular dystrophy. I wonder whether we can try and get together a ginger group of people such as yourself uh, uh, maybe not just CP, and just see whether we can have some sort of forum where you get to challenge us, the MPs, rather than we challenging you and the clinicians. So that worked really well when I when I ran that Young Disabled People group. Uh, people hated coming in front of it. It was like a select committee, and I was ferocious, as were they. So maybe that's what we can try and get towards. I'd love to go back to that. So we'll, yeah. we'll have a chat as, a, uh, as an APBG, but I'm, I would love to hear more from you because I, I, I think you've got a lot to offer. So I think, Mary, do you want to say, do you want to be the one to close matters <laughs> and tell us about the next one? will do, yes. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I found this so interesting, the whole, the whole meeting, some... Um, you know, I've learned an awful lot from this today. I mean, me personally, my early intervention was um, my mother saying to me, oh, I don't think Maria's developing at the right speed. And being a, 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 a new mum, I had no idea what a development should be. And, you know, Maria wasn't grabbing out or trying to crawl or do anything. So it was my, it was my mother who made that, made that early diagnosis. And te, as I say, 10 months before anybody else got, got involved. So I've learned an awful lot. And if we as politicians can, can do anything, um, well, I'm, I'm sure we can to, to move things on from, from those days then, that would be fantastic. I just want to thank the speakers um, and uh, you know some brilliant interventions and um, br brilliant contributions and thank all of the audience. These, these sorts of meetings, as you'll see from the participants where MPs come and go throughout the meeting because there are, there are other things that maybe voting or other meetings they've got to go to but hopefully we'll see some new faces um at the next meeting which will be on the 18th of december and that is looking at standard national pathways of care and centers of excellent excellence so i'm um, really looking forward to that so thank you for the to the whole audience there today listen i hope you've got as much out of it as i have and thank you for the speakers and thank you um Amanda and your team for for um for pulling this together. So um, um and I presume you'll all have made contacts now in the chat and have people's emails, email addresses. So let's let's hope you can keep networking that way. So um if there's anything, if there's nothing else, I'd like to formally close the meeting now and thank you once again and hopefully see some of you the next time. Thank you. Okay, thank you.